everybody. I'm Jim McGovern. I'm the National Priorities Project's new congressman. And I, uh, and I want to thank you for having me here tonight to celebrate 30 years of the National Priority Project and, and the incredible work that they do. Um, and let me just say a, a special uh, word of thank you to Joe Comerfed, who, who does an incredible job, um, who has been wonderful. And um, I want to... Um, I want to thank the 30th anniversary uh, host co-chairs, Dennis Bidwell and Shia Collins. And let me just tell you that I am so happy to be here in Northampton and not in Washington. Um, you, you, may, you may have read that we've had a few problems the last couple of weeks. Um, but, it, it is, but I really wanted to be here for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, Washington has become a place where fiction and distortion and lies oftentimes carry the day, in, especially when it comes to our budget. The notion that somehow investing more in weapons systems creates more jobs than investing it in civilian applications. And one of the great things about uh, NPP is that it, it provides us with something that's rare in Washington called facts uh, and the truth. Uh, and, um, and so I am... Um, I am anxious, um, as their new congressman, to get them down to Washington as many times as I can, into the offices of members of Congress, into the office of United States Senators, so we can get this budget straight. Because I believe that we ought to have a new definition of national security, uh, one that uh, is more than the number of weapons we have in our arsenal, but one that it measures things like jobs and the purity of our environment and the quality of education and health care for all. I mean, those are things to me that are every bit as important, if not more important, to our national security than all the weapon systems and all the military bases and all the wars that we've been fighting. So I, um, I had the, um, the honor of meeting uh, I.F. Stone in the l l later years of his life. Um, and I was a big fan of his. and. Um, and I, and I want to close with a quotation that um, I think is especially meaningful, uh, especially in the aftermath of all that's gone on in Washington. And, uh, and it kind of underscores the importance for us not to give up and to keep on fighting and for a better country. And this is what he said. He says, I think it's a citizen's duty to fight. You never can tell. Sometimes you win. A friend once gave me a word of hope. He said, you know, Izzy, if you keep on pissing on a boulder for about a thousand years, you'd be surprised what an impression you make. <laughs> now, he, he said, I never thought at the time of the witch hunts that I would live to see the day when J. Edgar Hoover would be recognized for the kind of jerk that he really was, and when guys like me would finally find a certain kind of acceptance, if not applause. I never thought th th that would happen. Who would have thought that, that a Senate committee would expose the dealings of the CIA? the attempts to kill Fidel Castro, the dirty work against Salvador Allende. That was wonderful. It's still a free society, but it will become less so if people don't have the courage to utilize it. And um, I, I leave you with those words because um, I, we need you. I need you. We need you to help push back against this right-wing onslaught in Washington that is trying to destroy this country. Uh, and you're going to hear later from one of my heroes, Barney Frank, who will put it all in perspective for you. But I just want you to know that all your emails, all your phone calls, all that you were sending to me and to others down in Washington, it was heard. It was helpful. It's nice to have a little wind at your back. So thank you for being here tonight. Enjoy the evening. Wow, SciTech Band and Jim McGovern. That's a pretty good way to start off an evening. Thank you, thank you, Congressman McGovern. Thank you so much for kicking off tonight's 30th anniversary celebration with those inspiring words. Thanks also for serving as honorary chair of the host committee of our event tonight. But thanks most of all for your work, uh, so tirelessly working on behalf of the priorities of this community. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Dennis Bidwell, and it is an honor to be here as the chair of the board of directors of the National Priorities Project. And I'm very pleased on behalf of the board 
and the incredibly talented staff of NPP to welcome you all to this 30th anniversary celebration. We're so happy you can join us here. I want to acknowledge some of the organizations and individuals who have contributed to make this night possible. At the top of the list is a force of nature in our community who joined me to co-chair the planning committee for this effort. I'm talking about Chia Collins. Chia's fingerprints are all over tonight's activities. This program is, uh, uh, has a lot to do with her creativity and energy. We're fortunate to have many generous supporters of tonight's celebration. They are, these underwriters have made it all possible. I want to extend special thanks to our lead underwriter, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, an affiliate of Massachusetts General Hospital. And there's also a number of other very generous underwriters uh, of our event tonight. Among them are Bay State Health, Michael Cohen and Chia Collins, Thompson Financial Management, Ben Cohen and Stamp Stampede, and the Columb Foundation. Let's hear it for all of them. You will find in your, in your program information about all of our underwriters and our many other supporters who have helped make this evening possible. And I encourage you, when you run into them, to thank them for their community-minded generosity. It's, a, it's, it's good neighbors and organizational and institutional friends like this that make a community like ours work. So please thank them on behalf of all of us. An event like this would not happen without literally hundreds of volunteers who have joined with NPP staff to make it happen. And I obviously don't have the opportunity to acknowledge them all, but in your program tonight, you'll find the names of my colleagues on the NPP board, you'll find the names of our row hosts, you'll find the names of our host committee, of our planning committee. So uh, all, of, all of you who are part of one of those groups or another who have helped make this evening possible. As you're able, please stand and accept the thanks of all of us for helping make this possible. Come on. There's... And I also want to thank Deborah J. Anthony and the staff of the Academy of Music who have extended themselves so much to make this evening possible. Thank you, Deborah J. <clears throat> We're pleased to have with us this evening several elected officials, including Northampton Mayor David Narkowitz, I believe Representative Ellen Story is with us this evening. and numerous local officials. And last but not least, trying valiantly to make it here this evening, and I don't know if he has made it here yet, is Senator Stan Rosenberg. Is he here? Earlier this afternoon, we were presented by, by Stan with an official Senate proclamation recognizing the extraordinary work of NPP over the last 30 years. And I believe this proclamation is out in the lobby for us to, for us to view. So thank you, Senator Rosenberg. Uh, now, I invite you to sit back and watch a short film produced for this evening by Valley filmmaker Roger Sorkin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Living in a democracy means that I have a say in how I want to live my life. Before I went to DC to go meet my congressman, people, everyone told me that I was crazy. Like, they're not going to listen to you because you're just one person and you're 15. Now that I've educated myself on the budget, 
when I hear someone, a politician, promise something, I know if it's realistic or not. I now know that I can tell them how I want things to be changed, like schools and housing and homelessness. A lot of people say that the budget is way too complicated to actually get your mind around, but if you get your mind around the budget, that's actually the most powerful thing you can do. All governments across the country have had to make cuts in critical services because of uh, lack of money flowing down from federal. Federal goes to the state and then to the city. The Conference of Mayors was really a bipartisan group. It was both Republicans and Democrats who looked at these figures and said, wow, everything federal government does trickles down to us. So the mayors got together to make it clear to uh, the federal government that this money, uh, we needed to start bringing this money home. If you care about really anything that affects your local life, then you should pay attention to the federal budget. Friends, I have an enormous opportunity this evening. I want to introduce you to Aaliyah Holness. Aaliyah, where are you? Can you stand for us? Aaliyah is here with her parents, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Diane and Henley Watson. <laughs> while we were filming, while we were making this film, Aaliyah mentioned that she was interested in running for elected office. So I say Aaliyah Holness for Congress. I met Aaliyah three years ago. Uh, she was one of the first young people in the nation to enter and win the If I Had a Trillion Dollars National Youth Film Festival. And so Aaliyah traveled to the Capitol where she screened her film in the House and the Senate and she met with lawmakers. And during an evening party, cheered on by a packed house, Aaliyah stepped onto a stage and someone from the back of the audience yelled to her, what are you gonna do now? And 15-year-old Aaliyah came to the edge of the stage and she said, where I come from, people think that nothing that we do is ever gonna make a difference. They think that we're not powerful. They think that things are never gonna change. But I learned about the federal budget and I made a video. I came to Washington and I spoke with my congressman. I gave voice to my priorities. I'm gonna go home and tell people that they're wrong we can make a difference, we are powerful, things can change. Well, no one moved. Aaliyah's words hung in the air. She called out our deepest fears, friends, that nothing we do will ever make a difference, that we'll never see the change that we pray for. And then she transformed those fears with a grace and a courage I have never seen before or since. She erased a doubt, she lit a fire, and none of us in the room would ever be the same. Every single day, because of your support, we work for Aaliyah Holness and young people like her across the country. We work for Matt Ryan, who knows the well-being of his city depends on his ability to use NPP's information to galvanize his fellow mayors and his constituents to take back the federal budget. We work for statewide networks, like one in Minnesota, which took NPP's information and put it on an interstate billboard and went on to pass 130 city council, community of faith and union uh, budget priorities resolutions this year alone. We work for you 
and the priorities that you have for your family and our community and our nation. Friends, facts matter. They are the currency of our democracy. They make us bolder and more resilient. They make us sharper and more effective. They propel us forward. You gathered here make NPP's efforts possible, and you're joined in this by thousands of constituents across the nation, by thousands of donors and supporters. You're the heartbeat. You're our source of power. You're the reason that change is possible. Your support allows NPP's rock star staff and intern and board to resource media and national partners and reach deeply into local communities. You know that the federal budget is the crossroads of our nation, the nexus of every single thing that we care about. You join us in celebrating public investment, success stories, like that of the SciTech band, that amazing band. And did you know that students who are band members for one year are twice as likely to graduate from high school than their peers? I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> students, yes, we should applaud. Students who are members of the SciTech band for more than one year are twice as likely to graduate from high school than their peers. Yeah. We want that opportunity for all our children. Every single one of our children should have that opportunity. There's enough money, it is a question of priorities. Tonight we're blessed with visionary speakers and artists and democracy champions who will expand our horizon and show us the promise of this great nation. They're also gonna lay bare the work to be done and we're gonna do it together. And tonight we invite you to go further, to deepen your partnership with NPP by joining the Change Maker Club. This evening, generous donors here with us will match every single donation, dollar for dollar, Change Maker Club donations up to $15,000. The crisis we've just come through is an outrage, and it was certainly preventable. While we can feel relieved and we should at the outcome, we must not yield. While we can and should celebrate stellar lawmakers like Jim McGovern, we must also acknowledge the power of millions of voices lifted together in protest. This is our time, friends. The way forward is open, made possible by the seeds planted by our founder, Greg Speeder, and three intrepid friends 30 years ago. Ahead will be long battles, they'll take years, and it will all be necessary, and it will be worth it. Because the only thing stronger, the only force stronger than money in politics and a lockdown Congress is a passionate and unyielding electorate, you, on the move for justice. Thank you. this Congress down. Again! Where are the Pepsi brothers? You thought the Koch brothers were bad. I'm Ann Rand Paul Pepsi. And I'm Martin Lockheed Pepsi. And we're here to take this be the change thing and put it on cruise control. Let's have a little green eggs and ham, Martin. I'm Uncle Sam. Yes, Sam, I am. Do you like Obamacare? I do not like Obamacare. Did you think it should pass the House? Should it cover your same-sex spouse? It should not have passed the House. There's no such thing as a same-sex spouse. <laughs> Is there, Barney Frank? I do not like it here or there. I do not like Obamacare. Well, have you heard all of the facts? It'll kill your grandma and raise your tax. Yes, I have heard all the facts about poor Nana and my tax. And I heard that it will pay for facelifts and iPhones for every Mexican. And have you seen the news on Fox? Obama's coming for your Glocks. I have seen all the news on Fox. And I blindly believe all of their talks. I do not like to lose my Glocks. That Gretchen Carlson is such a fox. It should not cover a same-sex spouse. It should never have left the house. 
I do not like it here or there. I do not like Obamacare. Why did you cave in, John Boehner? Now look, Mr. Petsy and Mr. Petsy, as an ACLU lawyer, I guess I've got to defend your right to engage in what in the law technically is called poetry. <laughs> but I'd say enough is enough. I got to tell you that what you had to say is enough to make almost anyone rethink this entire First Amendment thing. I'm going to oh, oh, I'm oh, standing oh, here oh, until oh, I turn as oh, orange oh, as the Speaker of the House. Oh, Paul Krugman began his column in today's New York Times by saying, quote, the government is reopening and we didn't default on our debt. Happy days are here again, right? And then he answers his own question with these words, quote, well, no. Krugman then goes on to discuss the damage to the economy caused by our lurching from one politically motivated and politically manufactured crisis to the next politically motivated and politically manufactured crisis, his conclusion is this. Things could have been worse. This week we managed to avoid driving off a cliff, but we are still on the road to nowhere. The issue before the House, this House, is how we exit what Krugman calls the road to nowhere. And that is what this evening is about. Tonight we celebrate 30 years of the National Priorities Project and the critical and unique role that it plays in giving voice, as Congressman McGovern says, to facts. It's unique and important role in removing the glaze from people's eyes when we talk numbers and the important role that it plays by allowing people to see how their government works or in the case of recent and not so recent history, doesn't. We are also here tonight not to be morose and not to be defeatist because we're not. And to give those who inspire us, including the SciTech ban. SciTech, for those of you who don't know, is a really tough high school. When Joe Comerford says you are twice as likely to graduate SciTech if you're in the band, it means this. Less than 50% of the kids who enter SciTech in the ninth grade will graduate. If you are in this band, you are among the 95%. 95% of the people in this band, those young men and women, will graduate. <laughs> and in case you don't know it, here's the most amazing part. Almost none of those young men and women ever played an instrument before they became a member of the band. Never. They didn't have lessons when they were in second grade or fourth grade or any other grade. They never had a lesson. They never held an instrument until they went to high school. Those kids, be the change, be the future. Those young men and women are the change. They are the future. We owe them a lot. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Gary and Bernice, the band leader, who does a remarkable job. We're here tonight to learn more than a little and to be inspired more than a lot. People here are, are of an age, in general, where you're going to remember the scene from the movie All the President's Men, where Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford playing Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward are meeting with their source, Deep Throat, in the garage. And Deep Throat gives this advice, follow the money. Generally. If you want to get to the truth of what is happening in an economy or a political system or in any given fight, follow the money is good advice. So I would invite us to spend just a moment reflecting on the name of the organization that we are here to support, the National Priorities Project, because within its name is a question, what are our national priorities? And you can get at that answer by following the advice, follow the money. 
Look at what in our federal budget is being cut. Look at what industries our government gives subsidies to. Look at the adamant opposition to raising taxes on the richest people in America, notwithstanding that the effective and marginal tax rate is a fraction of what it was in the 1950s when post-war America created enormous wealth. But there is reason to hope. We have smart leaders and extraordinary organizers who can help us and inspire us towards a government that prioritizes people over profit and long-term sustainability over short-term environmental degradation and who understand that when it comes to the necessity of creating capital to run an economy, that the most important capital is human capital. Tonight, we have three of those really smart, really talented, energetic, and energizing leaders, Barney Frank, Aiju Poo, and Kristen Rao Finkbeiner. And they'll be with you in just a minute. There's a lot of information about all three of them in your program. I'm not going to repeat it. I will give you two sentences on each one of facts you may not know about them. First, Barney Frank hopes that after 40 years in office in Massachusetts, the people who come to hear him actually know who he is. <laughs> so Congressman Frank prefers to be introduced without further ado, although he is, has expressed to us the hope and the wish that someday he will find out what further ado consists of. <laughs> Ai-Jen Poo has been organizing immigrant women workers since 1996. She's the director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and co-director of Caring Across Generations campaign, the Caring Across Generations campaign. And she says that, among other things, believes that love is the most powerful force for change in the world. Kristen Rao Finkbeiner is an author, activist, advocate for family and economic, secu family economic security, a wife, a mom, a policy wonk, a data lover, a coffee addict, I think that goes without saying, a superstar soccer player, and a blue Gatorade aficionado. Talk about one multifaceted woman. woman. So now, to hear our speakers, let me introduce, without further ado, the one and only Barney Frank. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the introduction. I, I will confess to uh, one regret uh, after many years of being introduced. Uh, uh, I am glad to be here celebrating the anniversary. Uh, I was only in Congress for three years when the organization was founded, so I've been introduced a lot. And I, I have this one regret, uh, having been introduced without further ado, I was hoping once in my life to find out what further ado, in fact, was. I would like to have seen it, but I guess I'll have to go without it. I am uh, very glad to be here because this is exactly what we need to get the country where it ought to be. But I, I want to begin uh, by saying, and I, I'm going to be honest with you, I, when I was in office, I never lied, but I didn't always volunteer the truth. And um, when I was told, as I looked at the program, that I would be listening to a high school band, I was not thrilled. <laughs> uh, but I got to tell you, that group was so good. And I don't even like music, to be honest with you. <laughs> but I had such a good time listening to them that I will tell you, if I was running the show the next time, ask McGovern and me to write down our speeches and hand them out and listen to those kids all night. You'll be a hell of a lot better off. And mentioning McGovern, I'll tell you what you already know. <clears throat> you have a superb member of Congress. Uh, given, the, given the vagaries of legislative redistricting, uh, one result of which in part was my retirement, um, Jim and I had joint custody of the city of Fall River for 16 years. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that people may not fully understand is that uh, egos being what they are, politicians who share responsibilities don't always get along that well. 
there tends to be a lot of competition about who gets credit, et cetera, et cetera. I am very proud that for 16 years, Jim McGovern and I shared the representation of that city and some other communities as well, and worked wholly, cooperatively, and I miss that collaboration. He has also been, for 16 years and before, as an aide to Joe Moakley, one of the upholders of America's conscience. So uh, you are very well represented indeed. Now as to the military budget. I was very frustrated to read in the New York Times about 10 days ago. Well, actually, I read two things in, in, in the, a week ago Sunday that, that uh, I was unhappy to read. One was, to be honest, that um, John Kerry had accomplished a great task and got an agreement with the president of Afghanistan that it will allow us to keep our troops there. Now, John's an old friend and colleague, and I am proud of him, and I admire his talents, and it was a, it was a very hard job that he accomplished. And I wish to hell he had failed. Because what he got was the right to spend tens of billions of dollars trying to make Afghanistan into a democratic, honest, tolerant society. I wish. I wish we could do that. I wish I could eat more and not gain weight. I wish a lot of things. But acting on unrealistic wishes is a great way to get into trouble. And we have done that. There's plenty for John to do. He's been very good in the Arab-Palestinian thing. I think thanks to some of what we did in Congress with the sanctions, we may be able to get to a reasonable agreement with Iran in which they are not armed with nuclear weapons. But when I read about how we're supposed to be grateful that Karzai is going to let us stay in his country and spend billions of dollars, much of which he and his successor that he names will siphon off, that we're supposed to be grateful. I, 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 I learn again the power of great literature because it is clear to me that there is an American novel that has had a great impact throughout the world, Tom Sawyer, because there are corrupt, oppressive, autocrats all over the world who have figured out how to get America to paint their fences and then have us be grateful for the right to do it. We spend far more on the military than makes sense. And the other article in the New York Times that troubled me was, and this is supposed to be a more liberal paper, it is more liberal in some ways, but it's bought into this myth. And the myth was that uh, we have to have a budget deal so that we can reduce the spending on Medicare and Social Security. When people want to cut them, they call them entitlements, as if that makes them kind of a bad thing. Yeah, I, I do believe that people 73 years old, uh, not an age I chose at random, to be honest with you, it just <laughs> came into my head, that, uh, that we are entitled to live lives of comfort, not luxury, that, uh, you know, if you're living, if you're living in Northampton or nearby on $1,500 a month, we shouldn't be cutting your cost of living increase. And uh, if you've been working as a waitress for 47 years, starting when you were 18, at 65, you ought to be able to put down the damn dishes and go on Medicare. So let's not stop that. What we do is cut the military. Look, the American people made it clear that they did not want us involved in Syria. I to be honest, thought the president had a good point in talking about a one-time punishment for chemical weapons. That is now working out very well, and I think he's going to be able to claim success in having seen the end of them. But the fact that the public did not want us to go into Syria in general is a good thing, but let's act on that. We have maintained a capacity to intervene in various countries, not because they are being attacked from somebody by somebody from the outside, but because we think we can make them more democratic, more religiously tolerant, etc. We can't. Let's be very clear. We have a wonderful military. They can do what a military does very well. A military can stop bad things from happening. No military can make good things happen. And we are spending hundreds of billions of dollars in a military trying to make bad th good things happen where we can't. A oh, couple of quick examples. We still have the capacity 
to drop thermonuclear weapons on the Soviet Union by three methods. Nuclear submarines, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the Strategic Air Command. There is no more Soviet Union. There is a country, Russia, not a great place. I'm glad my grandparents got the hell out of there. <laughs> but they barely, they, they were able to win a war against the country of Georgia. By the way, they probably couldn't have beaten the state of Georgia because the military bases down there are just enormous <laughs> because of that congressional crowd. We don't need three ways to drop thermonuclear weapons on the Soviet Union. If we told the Pentagon, you know what, just pick two, let's have a margin of safety, we'd save billions. There was an article in the New York, in, in the Wall Street Journal, the day after the election of 2012. I love to wing, read the right wing press when we win. Um, and um, this article from a guy who had been in the Air Force, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force under Bush said, look, here's our problem. We have no American military personnel have been injured by enemy aircraft since 1953. America has dominated every battlefield, the air over every battlefield since that time. And then they said, and you know what? Because of that, some people don't think we need to expand the Air Force. Yeah, I, I guess I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> but they said, we've got to be able to respond anywhere, anytime, to any trouble anywhere in the world. And while I am a great supporter of the president, he's a little bit too ambivalent about that. The president has got to stop saying or acting on the premise that we are the indispensable nation. There are many parts of the world where people are going to have to dispense with us because even if we wanted to and could afford it, we can't accomplish what they are seeking, what they're asking us to accomplish. And by the way, let's just, I'm going to finish by talking about this argument that it's bad domestic for, for, for the economy. First of all, please note the extraordinary inconsistency and hypocrisy of conservatives who tell us that building roads is not good for the economy, and building housing for the elderly is not good for the economy, and unemployment compensation is bad for the economy, but apparently maintaining bases in Germany is very good for the American economy. It's what I have called military Keynesianism. They think Keynes is wrong if about anything that will do some good domestically, but suddenly they become great believers in federal stimulus when it's international. In fact, sure, any money we spend will have some impact, but you get less bang for the buck in that, as Jim McGovern said, than in almost anything else. And in fact, unemployment in this country would be significantly lower, except for the fact that we have lost jobs at the state and local level in particular. If state and local hiring had stayed the same, teachers, firefighters, people who shovel the snow, et cetera, our unemployment would be below 7%. So the, the point is just overwhelming. We are spending far more than we need, far more than can usefully be spent. We are spending at a level that would support worldwide American intervention anywhere, anytime, anyplace into largely internal disputes elsewhere. We are far exceeding what we need to defend against enemies. I, and I know I'm a little over time. I just, one other important point you should know. We're supposed to be afraid of China. Well, I, I, I'm glad I don't live in China, but, uh, uh, and I wish they would not be so repressive. But you know the Chinese, how threatening they are? They actually did, in fact, two years ago, acquire an aircraft carrier, their first aircraft carrier. We got a lot of aircraft carriers. It was a retrofitted Ukrainian ship. <laughs> and until a few months ago, it had one defect as an aircraft carrier. You couldn't land planes on it. <laughs> it was parked next to a kind of a flat part of the mainland so they could practice with their eyes on this. Um, we're told we have to have a large navy, Mitt Romney said this, to prevent China, apparently, from shutting down the sea lanes. Well, you know what happens over the sea lanes? China makes an enormous amount of money. China is as likely to shut down the sea lanes as the pizza delivery trucks are to want to tear up the streets. That's how they stay in business. So, very simply, we have great unmet social and domestic needs. We could easily, easily, significantly expand it. Not everything we could spend well, but we could significantly expand our capacity to meet domestic needs, not cut back on the money we give to middle income and lower income, older people and their retirement years, and begin to reduce the deficit and whittle down the debt, ultimately, 
if we spent, and here's my proposal for military spending, spend what America needs plus 50%, and that would be a very big saving. And I, I know, but here is the last point, I want to reinforce what Joe said. Please, to my friends on the left, do not engage in the self-fulfilling prophecy, oh, they won't listen to us. I can tell you this, my former colleagues in government will certainly not listen to people from whom they do not hear. But politicians care a lot about voters. You, if we get people engaged, if everybody gets engaged, we can win it. And I will just close with this. It's a proposal that I, that I have made, and I know from Jim's voting record, it's one that he agrees with. Let's start with a very real specific. An amendment to the next defense bill that says we will begin the withdrawal of American military personnel from Afghanistan immediately, subject only to the requirements that it be done in a safe and orderly manner. The president says he wants to stay till the end of 2014 and maybe beyond. If we are out within six months, we will begin the process of reassessing our priorities with a saving of billions and billions of dollars and at no cost to any of our values. Thank you for the work that you do. Happy 30th anniversary to the National Priorities Project. <laughs> Huge congratulations uh, for the incredible, fantastic work that you've done over the last 30 years. It's truly an honor for me to be here with all of you and to be celebrating this incredible organization and all of this work. Um, I want to start my time with you tonight by introducing you to my grandmother. She is 87 years old, and she lives in sunny California. She loves to meet her friends for afternoon tea. She goes to church twice a week. She watches kung fu soap operas, and she plays a lot of mahjong. You do not want to take her on in mahjong. She lives an incredibly vibrant life at 87. And do you want to know her secret? Well, she actually has two. The first is that she makes sure to laugh big, hearty belly laughs at least three times per day. And the second is a woman named Mrs. Sun. Mrs. Sun is my grandmother's caregiver. She comes to my grandmother's home a few times a week and helps with the cleaning and the cooking so my grandmother can still live in her own apartment. When my grandfather had a stroke, it was Mrs. Sun who spent days and nights in their home helping care for him. My grandmother taught me most things that have mattered most to me in life. Well, she potty trained me, and it turns out that was useful. <laughs> Still useful. <laughs> most importantly, she taught me my values. And one of the things she would always say is that caring is life's greatest gift. Like domestic workers across the United States, Mrs. Sun contributes so much to my family, our community, our economy, and still most domestic workers are paid poverty wages when they're paid at all, with few worker protections or basic benefits, and many are undocumented immigrants with no access to citizenship, which we are going to change. But as it turns out, we live in a country where the people who care so much for us are often not cared for in return. Which is why I'm organizing alongside domestic workers around the country, women like Marlene Champion, uh, who's a caregiver in New York. And she's seen it all. She's seen the wonderful employers who stay in touch um, their entire lives. And she's also seen the ones who ask you to get on your hands and knees and clean the bathroom floor with a toothbrush. Marlene helped us pass the first Domestic Workers Bill of Rights in the country in New York State. And, yes. That breakthrough victory has led to many other victories, including two this year, as Hawaii and California became the second and third states to pass statewide domestic worker bills. And we're looking forward to a victory right here in the state of Massachusetts next year. Yes, with all of your help. But a few years ago, Marlene and many others began coming to us asking for training in elder care. 
more and more domestic workers were being called upon to take care of the aging relatives of their employers. And what we realized was that they were experiencing firsthand a tremendous change that was happening in the country. On the one hand, communities of color, particularly immigrant communities, are growing at an incredibly rapid pace. And we often hear about the fact that by 2040, we will become a majority minority nation. We're already starting to feel the ways in which this change is beginning to reshape American politics. But there's another change happening, the age wave. People are living longer, and the baby boom generation is beginning to turn 65 at a rate of a person every eight seconds. 10,000 people per day, 4 million people per year turn 65 in America. Some call it the silver tsunami. Whatever you call it, it has arrived. And the truth is, every single one of us is experiencing the age wave in our lives. We each probably have a story of someone we love who is getting older and needs some more support, perhaps someone who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or who had a heart attack. The need for care and support for the aging and people with disabilities is great, and it touches all of us. And many of us experience it in the form of a crisis. We can't afford it, we can't manage it, or the people we want to hire are undocumented or untrained from every angle. It's not working. And we're all dealing with it, for the most part, in isolation. So a couple years ago, we began meeting with home care unions, aging and disability groups, women's groups, groups like National Priorities Project. And what we realized is that there's an enormous opportunity here to create a win-win solution. A solution, a whole new approach based on care as an American value. One that brings together the interests of families and individuals in need of care with people and families who provide it to create a more caring economy and society for all of us. Our movement is called Caring Across Generations, and we're building what we call a caring American majority, putting forward a vision for the future that fundamentally ties our interests together across age, race, and generation. We're so proud to be partnering with the National Priorities Project in this movement. This year in Ohio, we won over $160 million in Medicaid money to support home care. And just several weeks ago, we helped bring 1.8 million home care providers under minimum wage and overtime protections. But what I really wanted to say tonight is that really this is just the beginning, scratching the surface of what's needed. Our future is full of big challenges and opportunities. We live in a time of such profound change. Our home, our nation is being reshaped every minute. These demographic changes mean that we must pay particular attention to building a new economy that truly includes and supports all of us, including a federal budget that reflects the new realities and real needs of American families in the 21st century, from the white retiree in Oregon to the immigrant domestic worker in Massachusetts, to the African-American teacher in Mississippi, to the transgender young person in Arizona, it's a moment to rethink opportunity for the 21st century and to reshape our movements accordingly. To open up who we consider to be the we. How we think about our nation's priorities and reimagine how we're investing in the health and well-being of Americans across generations. We believe it begins with our core shared values. Each of us can identify some core values that help us remember what matters most and bring out the best of who we are. Whether it's child care, elder care, health care, or education, how do we begin to create public policy and budgets that reflect the values that are broadly shared in the American public? This is becoming only more important as the changing role of money in politics means that hundreds of millions of dollars are spent uh, on political ads that are rooted in fear and division, 
polarizing our interests against one another, creating the mythical us versus them every election cycle. The only antidote is to reground ourselves in values like respect, care, opportunity, democracy, and dare I say love, the stuff that our grandmothers taught us. In a paradigm shift moment, our strategies must both meet and rise above the moment. We must be creative and bold, take new risks to reach beyond those who, are al who already agree with us, connect our issues and solutions. It's up to us to build the kind of intergenerational caring movement of millions with the power to take back the federal budget, transform the economy, and restore the soul of the country. It's up to us. And if there's one thing that being in the domestic workers movement has taught me, it's that anything is possible. Si se puede. Yes, we can. Hi, Jin Pu, thanks so very much. And now, Kristen Rao Finkman. Kristen. Thank you for having me here. Eh, I can't talk. After all of these eloquent speakers, I've almost lost my voice. I almost want to give another round of applause because that was so amazing. So I'm honored to be here tonight to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the National Priorities Project and to join with each of you in the rallying cry to be the change and to take back the federal budget. It's time. To start, I want to share a special, very public thank you to the National Priority Project. As we've all seen in the news lately, the work that this organization does to make our complex federal budget transparent and accessible is needed now more than ever before. Can we give them a round of applause? I want to talk for a minute about information. Information is the currency that makes democracy possible. And without accurate information, all we have is a bunch of loud noise that we have heard on cruise control recently. So the National Priorities Project is irreplaceable. As you in this room know, our current national budget not only determines our future success as a nation, but it is also the difference between whether or not many people can put food on their table each night whether people can deposit a paycheck in the bank, whether people can go to work and have their kids be in a safe, enriching place while they are at work. And it's even the difference between life and death for some people, including people like Mary, a Moms Rising member from Louisiana with advanced stage cancer, who during the government shutdown wrote us with this story. Quote, I am running out of treatment options and was hoping to enroll in a National Cancer Institute clinical trial next week. There is a promising new trial drug that could extend my life by 12 to 18 months. This time would allow me to see my daughter graduate from high school and to see my son play another season of soccer. But this senseless government shutdown has closed all clinical trials to new enrollees." End quote. We're talking about people's lives. We're talking about Mary's life. And Mary isn't alone. At Moms Rising, the organization where I work, hundreds of stories from moms across the nation have poured in over the last couple of weeks about how the shutdown and the national budgeting process is impacting people in their everyday lives. We're hearing from parents who are working hard, who are playing by the rules, and they're still struggling to provide the basic necessities like food, medicine, shelter, and childcare for their children. And we all know that for the 46 million people living in poverty in America right now, providing programs like SNAP, like Medicaid, like Head Start, and WIC is a lifeline. It's time for us to stand up. It's time to be the change. Because we know that the funding in this area isn't just about helping individual people. This funding provides an excellent future return on investment for everyone. For example, one study found that for every $1 that taxpayers put into food stamps, or SNAP, taxpayers later get back $1.78. That is almost double the profit. 
Now let's talk for a moment, why is this return so high? And this is one of the frustrating parts with the current conversation inside the belt right, right, Beltway right now because the Tea Party extremists who are laser focused on breaking down our government no matter the math are saying, we want to say to them, it's the economy, stupid. Do the math, do the arithmetic. We're all in this together because we know that in our current consumer-fueled economy, if people don't have funds to spend on food, if people aren't making equal wages for equal work, if people don't have money to spend at local stores in our communities, then the dominoes fall and our whole entire economy suffers. It turns out, not surprising to us in this room, that we're all in this together. That's right, we are all in this together. That's why it's so important that we continue to not only carefully watch budget negotiations or the lack thereof, but also to get intimately involved in ensuring that the federal budget prioritizes programs that allow our nation's moms, kids, families, and indeed our entire national economy to survive and also to thrive. Since our inception, Moms Rising has been committed to doing just that as we work in collaboration with stellar organizations like the National Priorities Project. In fact, for the last six years, Moms Rising has shown the extraordinary power of moms, proving that mom power is indeed very strong. Let me take a moment right now to demonstrate the power of moms. Would everyone who is a mom please stand? All right, now would everyone who has ever at any point in their life had a mother, please stand. Let's stand up. Look around, take a moment. There is some power in this room. Do you feel the power? There is some power. You can sit down now. <laughs> Moms Rising has fought hard these last few years, and we stand ready to continue fighting with you all to do one thing, and that is to take back the federal budget. Last year, as the fiscal cliff negotiations were happening, Moms Rising launched a campaign calling on Congress to not put kids and families in an unbearable situation. I have to bring my prop. Get it? An unbearable situation. By balancing the budget on their backs and by cutting essential programs like Medicaid, which covers one in three kids in our nation right now. We help bring needed perspective to leaders in Washington, D.C., who were stuck in a marbled echo chamber by bringing the experiences of folks outside the Beltway, inside the Beltway. We delivered more than 500 stories about the impact of budget cuts in a book similar to this one, but in more fabulous, colorful form, to both in district local offices, as well as to every member of Congress, along with a fabulous teddy bear saying, do not put families in unbearable situation. Pay attention and prioritize what you're doing with the national budget. It's safe to say that the voices of moms, thank you, <laughs> the voices of moms and fluffy teddy bears actually did help prevent some of the most egregious cuts to critical services that were on the table. But this year, it was like deja vu all over again. Sequestration led to across-the-board budget cuts, with the most vulnerable among us feeling the cuts most deeply. And then there was the shutdown and the debt ceiling debacle. So working in collaboration with information gurus at the National Priorities Project, Moms Rising members jumped to action again, immediately advocating for prioritizing children and families in the budget negotiations, sending tens of thousands of letters to leaders, making phone calls, having meetings, and sharing hundreds of stories about the impact of the shutdown with the White House, with congressional leaders, with the media, and with our own over 1 million members and our own over 3.5 million readers of our social media and blogging network. Work. In fact, <clears throat> and as you may have noticed as we're talking about bears and I'm about to talk about hula hoops, Moms Rising often advocates in a somewhat unusual way in order to break through the media chaos and to have our voices heard. So why do we use humor? Why do we use bears? Why do we use hula hoops? Why have we delivered green beans and napkins to show that moms can hear what's going on when people are trying to slide things into the budget? We know when our kids are hiding green beans in the napkin and we know when members of Congress are trying to slide budget pieces away. Why do we do that? Well, MRI studies of the brain show that in order to get people out of partisan locked thinking, which is an actually an emotional section of your brain, you can use humor 
to slide people over more to an open-minded thinking. So we often use humor. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, Moms Rising brought a giant 40-foot by 60-foot shoots and ladders of opportunity game to Congress, and elected leaders came out to play the game and to even hula hoop, this is Senator Harkin, as well as to talk about policy priorities to the media along with dozens of moms and children. And I want to say we will do whatever it takes to break through the Beltway bubble, even if it means getting senators to hula hoop on the Capitol lawn. <laughs> and Moms Rising will continue to raise the voices of families alongside the National Priorities Project moving forward. I want to close by saying, especially, especially in times like these, with the government shutdown not far away in our rearview mirrors, the raw edge of democracy can be tragic, messy, frustrating, accidentally hilarious. Is anyone feeling a craving for green eggs and ham? And it can be tedious. Some get cynical and step back. But in times like these, it's more important than ever to step up. At the core, people power is still what ultimately fuels our democracy. And it's ultimately what anchors our nation. To be blunt, the time to double down on democracy is now. It's time to be the change. The silver lining of this current fiasco is that more people are now aware of what is lost when our national budget fails, as it just did. More people are paying attention. So in closing, I leave you all with a fun challenge. <laughs> in this time when all eyes are pointed at the national budget, your voice is needed. It's time to let our leaders know that we are each stepping up, and we will not be pacified by short-term budget solutions that are really just a game of kick the can down the road. And to solidify that challenge, we're now going to distribute some pacifiers. Get your catching mitts ready. Are you ready to catch a pacifier? To you. All right. Let's talk about this challenge. You didn't know that we were going to lock the doors until you talked about pacifiers tonight. In terms of the challenge, I challenge everyone here to take five minutes within the next week to talk to a member of Congress and to tell them that you expect them to step up, that you expect them to stand up for real priorities, for the priorities of family as they go through this next phase of the budgetary process. And the special challenge that goes to the folks who just got a pacifier, you know who you are, we're paying attention, we know who you are now too, we can check back with you, is to pass that pacifier on. Deliver that pacifier directly to an elected leader along with your message that you won't be pacified by short-term non-fixes in our national budget. Thank you. So thank you all very much, Congressman Barney Frank, I. Jen Poo, Kristen Rao Finkbeiner. Were they fabulous or what? They're back. Time now for the Pepsi Brothers musical interlude portion of the show. This is a little song we learned from the greatest band ever, Michelle Bachman Turner Overdrive. <laughs> I think you may be familiar with it. Get it, Marty. This land is my land. This land is my land. Except California and New York Island. Made for me. Made for me. No, me. me. Shut up. Shut up. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Mitch and Alicia Shakur, and Sonia Kim. We're calling this moment sort of the head, shoulders, knees, and toes part of the program. Something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there telling me I got to beware. It's time to stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. You're more, more than welcome to clap if you want, but make sure it's on the two and the, the three, huh? That's why. All right, here we go. Battle lines being drawn. Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Young people speaking their minds. Mostly so from me behind it's time we stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all. What a field day for the heat. A thousand people in the streets singing songs and carrying signs. Mostly saying, hooray for our side. It's time to stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. I know you know it, so if you sing, it's all right. Paranoia strikes deep. Into your life it will creep. It starts when you're always afraid. Step out of line, and it comes and take you away. It's time we stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody, look what's going down. I think we need y'all to sing. Will you sing tonight? I said, will you sing Northampton tonight? All right, now let's make it a little difficult because I know that most of us are a little educated. I'm going to have y'all sing. This side sing, stop. Hey, what's that sound? It's all right. Okay, we'll try that again in a second. Are you ready? We'll help out. Here we go. I say, stop. What's that sound? Everybody, look what's going down. 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 Yeah, all right. you're all wonderful. What, what an incredible evening. What an incredible, incredible evening. Uh, I feel sometimes that uh, the artists and the musicians are the glass of water after all the hard work that everyone's doing. So we, we, we're so great that we can turn to our prophets and our poets. This seem to mostly come from around the 60s. <laughs> and so please sing along. While we were looking for songs for this, there are so many to choose from and so many wonderful things and so many wonderful questions to be asked. So uh, we found this one. And you know it. You sing along, all right? You will know it. You will know it. And you will sing along. <laughs> and you will sing along. All right. <laughs> Do you know what it is? No, of course not. <laughs> not That's yet. right. That's right. <laughs> I say, how many roads must a man walk down before you can call him a man? How many seas must
just a white dove sail Before she can rest in the sand mm -hmm. How many times can the cannonball be fired Before they're forever He's always pretending. Pretending he just doesn't see. Don't you know that the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Well, the answer, my friend. Tonight, I have the real honor kicking off a year-long celebration of more stellar changemakers, tonight's Democracy Champions. Friends and partners of MPP whose work, like WAND and AFSC and NCS, N, FCNL, uh, is shaking up our nation and, doing, and they're just doing amazing things. We celebrate tonight's award winners in honor of Greg Speeder and Francis Crow, MPP's original champions and our guiding stars. <laughs> the women and men we're honoring as democracy champions are the vanguard of the student, environmental, immigrant rights, labor, transparency, racial justice, and women's rights movements. They inspire us every single day. Behind me on screen is a photo montage. Please use your programs to learn more about these incredible human beings. Our website has a good deal of background information on them as well. And beginning next week, we'll be celebrating each democracy champion individually, both by tr traditional and social media. Now, in addition to tonight's esteemed guest speakers, I, Jen, Kristen, Barney, and Jim, we have awardees Catherine Peters and Seth Flaxman from TurboVote with us today. TurboVote is their organization they co-founded and which is aims to make civic participation through voting as easy as renting a DVD through Netflix. And in a country ranked 138th in the world in voter participation, their work is both brilliant and necessary. Thank you, Catherine and Seth. <laughs> we 
We also have much beloved local and national champion, Tim Carpenter, with us tonight from Progressive Democrats of America. Thank you, Tim, for all of your amazing work. We were delighted to receive video recordings from some of our champions and have spliced them together for you. Following these, we'll have a special message from Bill Moyers. It is so funny that the National Priorities Project is honoring me as a democracy champion because the National Priorities Project is the real champion here. You guys spend hours, years actually, tracking down and crunching numbers that allow people like me to confidently say that there is enough money to start building a better future, that our country's not broke, our spending priorities are just messed up. So thank you for all the work that you do and thank you for including me in this year's Democracy Champions. The National Priorities Project is part of how we can do the work we do with nuns on the bus. It's a national priorities project that gives us a lot of data, helps us analyze, and then we're able to take it and then use it in nuns on the bus, mind and mend the gap, our big projects and our new project, we the taxpayer. So it's democracy, it's us working together. That's how it works. So thanks for the honor, thanks for the fine work. Hi, I'm Ben, the ice cream guy, yeah. And I am like a major NPP fan. Why? Because NPP takes all those crazy numbers coming out of Washington and brings them home to the local level and explains to people what exactly it means in terms of trade-offs. Good evening. My name is Sarita Gupta. I'm the Executive Director of Jobs with Justice. I want to thank the National Priorities Project for recognizing my work and for this incredible honor to me given who National Priorities Project is and the way in which you've been an incredible ally to Jobs and Justice over the years. Hello, this is Bill McKibben. Um, I am so wish I was there with you, not for me, but for all the people who've been working in this new resurgent uh, grassroots environmental movement that we came to Washington because that's where these decisions get made. And it really has given me a sense of what y'all are up against there and how grateful uh, we all should be for the work you're doing in making more transparent this series of, well, of really terrible choices that we're managing to make as a society. We're so grateful for the work that you guys do. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tiffany Dina Lofton, and um, I'm sorry I can't be there tonight, but I do want to thank the National Priorities Project. The United States Student Association definitely relies heavily on the resources and support that the National Priorities Project provides as um, we enter another election year. It is very important to work together in teams and with folks who know what they're doing and folks who do a fantastic and great job at doing it. Thank you all for your fantastic dedication and your work to not only communities like mine, but also to organizations in D.C. who rely heavily on the resources and information. Congratulations. You all deserve to celebrate. Hi there, this is Bill Moyers, and I want to thank you for your recognition of my work, all the more so because I have long admired your work and used much of it in my journalism over the years. I would be there with you tonight, except my wife and partner Judith had knee surgery today, so I can't tell you in person what I'd like to express now. Some of my heroes are there with you, Arnie Frank, Ajahn Poo, Jim McGovern, and others who have been and are so important to the continuing fight for democracy. I believe the tide is turning, that the spirit of social democracy is rising across this country, and that we're going to see a great progressive movement begin to emerge. Your own work over the past three decades has indeed fallen on fertile ground, and I sense a passion and a purpose today that makes this a moment of great opportunity. One of my heroes, the progressive Robert La Follette from the early part of the last century, once said that democracy is a life and requires daily struggle. That's what all of you are about. Passionate citizens do make a difference. They are the reason America is going to turn around. I'm honored to be on your side. Happy 30th. Oh, friends. 
Phil Moyers says it so well. The tide is turning. The spirit is lifting. And if democracy is a life that must be nurtured, the National Priorities Project is its sustenance, its food. It's an engine of our movement. We resource people on the front lines in every sector. Your donations will take us this year onto more college campuses. We're gonna write another people's guide to the federal budget. We're gonna go deeper into the halls of Congress and on radio stations from Louisiana to California. Your support this evening will be the building blocks of a healthier, more vibrant, renewed democracy. Please, friends, those of you who have given so much already, please give or pledge tonight. Specifically, we're asking you to become change makers, to join the Change Makers Club. Every single person who pledges to become a monthly donor tonight will be matched dollar to dollar up to $15,000 by generous donors in your midst this evening. To sign up for the Change Makers Club, all you have to do is just fill out a card and drop it in a basket. And of course, if you want to make a donation this evening, you can use the envelopes in your programs. And again, I am so grateful. Tonight, volunteers will be in the back to collect them. And tomorrow and Monday and Tuesday, we will get up and we will steward your resources well. We are a small but mighty team connected to teams across the country. And this year, this year, friends, we're going to turn this budget around in your name and in name people all across the country just like you. So thank you on behalf of the staff and board for joining us this evening. It's a great honor. And now Alicia, Mitch, and Sonia are going to sing us home. Good night. Thank you. Like the river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know the change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it's been too. Then I go to my brother And I say, brother, help me please, yeah But it winds up knocking me Back down Oh, yes, it will. 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 Oh, yes, it will.
It's time for y'all to sing. some friends are gonna come out. People can be so cold, yeah. They'll hurt you and desert you. They'll take your soul if you let them. But don't you let them, don't you let them. You just Feeling tired, I want you to know. You got a when you feel like you can't go on, you got a when you're feeling lonely, you got a when you feel like it's the darkest night. NPP's gonna hear you now. You got a friend. We sing to national priorities. Say that, y'all. You got a friend. You sing to these powerful young children, y'all. You got a friend. You sing to all the soldiers that are out there working. You got a friend. In Washington. Come on. 
You've got a friend. God bless you. Keep up the good fight. Don't give up. Mitch Shakur, Alicia Shakur, Sonia Kitchell, and the SciTech Band. Good night, everybody.